Uh, this is an interview at the Lexington Avenue Armory in New York City, August 6, 2002. Uh, it's approximately 10.40 a.m. Uh, this is an interview of Dominic Brancone uh, by Michael Russert. Uh, could you tell me your name, date of birth, and place of birth? Yeah, uh, my name is Dominic Brancone. Thanks. Uh, I'm sorry. My date of birth is 2. 2223, and I was born in Brooklyn. Okay, and what was your pre war education? Uh, I, I did not complete high school, I had another year to go, but uh, I had to go to work and uh, we were needed the money, so I left high school. Okay, what kind of work did you do? I was in the automotive field. We did some repairs on trucks. Uh, that only lasted until uh, at the end of 42, I was 18 and a half years old and I was drafted. Into the okay. Um, when did you hear about Pearl Harbor and what was your reaction to it? Yeah, I was, uh, I was in, on Cherry Street in Manhattan. I was working in a garage and uh, it came over the news. And what I recall was everybody came out of the buildings. Everybody stopped working. They just flooded the streets, and I remember seeing young men, maybe in the age of 19 or 20, marching down the street, going down the White Hill Street to sign up, just spontaneously. They all just left the jobs and started marching down the middle of the street. What was your personal reaction to this news? Well, I. Um, I was a little bit young, not, I mean, you know, I wasn't mm -hmm. at the age of, of, of enlistment, but I, uh, I was very surprised and I was stunned like anybody else. It was uh, a big thing, you know, but uh, everybody just went out and they wanted to sign up. So you were drafted? I was drafted. Okay. Could you tell us about when you went into service and your uh, basic training? Yes, I, uh, I, uh, I was 18 and a half years old, and uh, I was drafted into the Army, and I uh, went to Fort Dix, and from there I was sent to Camp Maxi, Texas, uh, where I did my basic training. Okay, what were you, did you just have the basic combat infantry training, or did you have any special? No, we, 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 I was in the 105 Howitzer Division. Uh, it was a 250 field artillery battalion, and we trained on the 105 guns. Um, did you, uh, what, where did you go from there? Well, we, uh, we went to Louisiana on maneuvers, and, uh, from there, we uh, went to uh, we came to New York, and we shipped out to, to Europe. Okay, um, how did you go to Europe? We went by um, it was uh, an English ship, which previously was a, a liner, a luxury liner. They converted it to a troop ship, and uh, I remember the name, the Minic the, the Minic Monarch was the name of the ship. And uh, that took us over and we, um, we landed in Liverpool, 14 days. Okay. Uh, was it in a large convoy? It was in the biggest convoy uh, of the war. They called it the Victory Convoy. Mm -hmm. It was uh, many, many ships. Complete blackout. You know, everything was uh, heavy draped. You couldn't smoke on the deck, you know. And uh, we eventually got to Liverpool. And where did you go from there? Well, from Liverpool, uh, we went by train. We went to, uh, uh, it was a, a camp that the British soldiers were using, but it was evacuated, it was empty. There were quads of huts. And uh, we went there by train. And uh, I used to remember, I forgot the name of the town. Anyway, uh, we got there. And then we were, we, uh, from there we went to Wales on maneuvers. We were firing uh, our guns. And uh, 
I got to uh, go to London one day to meet my brother-in-law, who was in the 8th Air Force. And with all the millions of men, it was a miracle that I met him. Um, what were your interactions with the civilians, uh, the English civilians? Uh, the English? Yes. Well, uh, we weren't well liked. You know, they, um, they had a phrase we were overpaid, oversexed, over everything, you know. So they, the, in particular, the, the service people didn't care for us. And there were times when, uh, when the, the American soldier was out on the, a pass and there'd be a lot of fights, you know. Um, what time of year was it? I forgot when you, uh, you reached England. Um, uh, I believe it was March. March of 44. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, what about the food you received and extra training you received there? Well, that, when we got to England, that was the first time I had powdered eggs. I never had that in my life. Mm -hmm. But uh, that would be sorry for breakfast. No. They'd make pancakes out of it or they'd make scrambled eggs out of it. Uh, that was about, you know, the food was all right. Not to brag about, but it was all right. Now, with your uh, artillery unit, um, how many guns were, did you have a battery? Yeah, we had a battery. Guns were in it? Yeah, we had a battalion, mm -hmm. and then we had uh, A battery, B battery, and C battery. We had service battery, but we had uh, three batteries of uh, four guns per battery. Mm -hmm. And what was your particular role in the battery? I was a number two man. I used to load it, mm -hmm. load the breach. What, well, what type of gun was it? Like a 105? 105 it was a 105 howitzer. It was truck drawn. We took it up in the back of a 6x6 truck. That was pulled. When you got to the area where you were going to fire it, everybody would jump off the truck as fast as they could, unhook the piece, spread it, and then they had men unloading the ammunition. And we get the, that was part of the, uh, the training, was to compete with the other batteries. How fast you can get fire. What do you mean spread it? Well, they, they had a, a tripod in the back. Mm -hmm. When you when you trucked it, it was pulled together and hooked on the truck. So when you got to the position, you would have spread those out because they would you know they would dig into the, the ground. When you fired, they would dig in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you were in the Normandy invasion. Could you uh, talk about uh, your yes. preparations and so on for that? Yeah, we were, we were shipped, oh, I remember the town that we were in uh, when we got to England, the Quatsaputs, uh, the camp was called Bury St. Edmunds was the town. And uh, we were shipped from that town, after we completed our manoeuvres, we went to, uh, we went to Liverpool, and uh, we were going to be shipped out. Nobody knew anything about where we were going, you know. and. Uh, we got there and we uh, boarded the uh, ships that were supposed to be, that, that eventually took us to, to Normandy, but nobody knew where we were going. And uh, we stood on those ships about four or five days. I guess we were waiting for the weather to clear up. We didn't, they didn't get the okay. We were on the ship for four or five days docked. And uh, I remember they had a big kettle on the deck, tremendous kettle and they had cans of uh, uh, sea rations. They, they come in a can, spam, beans, or whatever it is. They were all mixed up, and they'd have them all in that, that big vat. And that's what we're eating out of that. Then eventually they, uh, they shipped out. They went out, uh, we went out, we, we left about five days after the initial landing. We were coming in behind them, and uh, the English Channel was very rough. We eventually got there and we got off the ships and went to the LSTs, I guess they call them, and they brought us ashore. When we uh, got ashore, 
maybe a half a mile was where the uh, the front was up. They were going up about, about a half a mile. We were right behind them. And uh, we were attacked at the 3rd Army initially. And when we got there, they, uh, they, they took us out of the, they, they transferred us right on the beach to the 2nd French Armored Division. There was an armored division uh, under the command of uh, General Laclock. All Frenchmen, armored, tanks. And uh, they were a mixture of maybe Moroccans and uh, Arabians and they all wore, they, they had the American uniform on, they were using the American equipment, but their headgear, you see a, a big red uh, Moroccan hat, you know, on one of them, and a turban on another guy. But uh, that was the only, the only difference you saw in the uniform, was the headgear. And uh, they, they, they had the ones that were, went up and spearheaded. They were fighting now on their own soil. They were French. They wanted to liberate France. The next town might have been where their mother father was, you know. They were very fierce fighters. They didn't think of nothing up, baby. Should bring it up five tanks and lose them to get one up there. But they were very fierce fighters. And they, they, they didn't fight like the American soldier. They did it their way, you know. They, you would they, explain what you thought was the difference? Well, we were more regimental, but they were more or less on their own. They, they just take off and go and head out to, to you know, take this town without, uh, they're just with gung ho, you know. And we were with them. Mm -hmm. But uh, the day were, that's where they were. I'd see them jump off the tanks and uh, go out in the field and bang, shoot a cow or a pig, you know, and bring them back. <laughs> they were good fighters, but they, they didn't hit value their lives. Now, which uh, beach did you land on? Was it Utah? Utah. And uh, they were good fighters, but they lost a lot of equipment. And they, uh, well, I have a list of all the towns we went through, but we went from, uh, from the Normandy all the way through France with them. When we were outside of Paris, approximately 10 miles from Paris, they stopped us. And they said, we're going to stay right here. And they're going to let this, this, the 2nd French Armored Division is going to go in and liberate, uh, liberate Paris. They didn't want us to go with them. So that's the outfit that went in and initially liberated Paris. They went in and they took it over. And then we followed up. What was the relationship between the American units and, and the French? Oh, it was very good. They were, they, were, they were very friendly. They thought we were crazy. And I follow them so close. <laughs> uh, okay, did you enter Paris eventually? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. What happened was, it's, uh, I never won nothing in my life. I never did. But while the, uh, the Second French Army Division was in Paris, they liberated, they were there, uh, our commander said, well, let's, let's get some names in a hat. We're going to pick out 12 guys to go to Paris. And I was lucky that day. I went, when I went in, it was like, a, you know, you, if you walk for an hour, you wouldn't find another GI there. But was, you know, it, there was no, no American soldiers in there. You'd walk around, you'd go by yourself, they'd pull you into the bars, they'd, you know, they were, good, they were glad to see you. Uh, that's the only time I wanted to. And the French were very nice to us. Hey, what happened after Paris? Well, uh, after Paris, we uh, we headed up toward Germany. Uh, I'm not too sure what, I think it's the Seine River or the, the Rhine River. When we got to the Rhine River, we were written up in the, in the Stars and Stripes that we had fired, or my outfit had fired the one million shot across the river. And then from there we went into um, Munich, we were through, fighting in Munich around in that area. And then when we left Munich, we were heading toward Austria. And uh, it's a funny thing, we were, the 
about that time that the, uh, the GIs, they were using uh, German equipment. They were driving German Jeeps, German motorcycles, you know. And uh, it was part of our equipment now, you know. But when we got to uh, Salzburg, Austria, we got to Salzburg, and that's just when the war had ended in Europe. And they had a big field there. They said everybody with these Schreiber and the motorcycles was parking them there. Now they're getting back to the old military, you know, no more doing what you wanted to do. <laughs> so they parked all the old stuff there, motorcycles and all. And uh, that's just on the foot of the Alps, Salzburg. And we camped there. And the war had just, the war had just ended. We stood there for about maybe two or three weeks. And they called me up and uh, three other, three other uh, soldiers and they transferred us. I was in the 250th Field Artillery Battalion and they transferred, transferred us to the 247th, I believe. No, 342. I wasn't here too long. The 342nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion. Now this uh, battalion was not truck drawn. These were, these were uh, tanks with the 105s mounted on the tank. It was, uh, you know, completely uh, armored. So when I got there, uh, I was still there maybe a couple of weeks, and, they, they, and uh, what they were doing, they were setting up this 342nd <clears throat> to send back to the States a short, a short uh, furlough and then be shipped to the, south, to the Pacific. That's what that's the, was the plans. So when we, um, before we shipped out, of course, in those days, uh, when you were shipped back to the States, they had the, these camps where they processed, they gave you new uniforms, you know, clean you up a little bit. And what they did was, it's funny that these camps were named after cigarettes. It was like Camp Lucky Strike, okay, Camp Chesterfield, Camp, you know, Camel, and that's where you went into and you uh, got cleaned up. But uh, it's unbelievable that they named it after cigarettes. They must have donated cigarettes to the GI. Well, we got a lot of cigarettes, just that we did. Uh, we used to get K rations. It was a, you know, a box maybe four by eight and maybe two inches thick. It was, they had a cosmoline wax so it'd be waterproof, but inside of it, which we, we were eating quite a bit, would be um, a five pack, of, five pack of cigarettes, you know, and uh, there'd be a can of maybe a solid chunk of cheese in a can, crackers, uh, instant coffee, and that was your, that was your meal. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back a little bit to uh, some things. Did your unit suffer any losses, combat losses? Yes, we lost, uh, we lost, uh, I don't know exactly how many men, but I would say maybe, uh, I, I'd say a dozen to 15 men we lost. I remember one incident uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, we were a little bit away from that particular area, not too far. Well, what I, I do remember is that um, uh, we were set up in a field with the guns and uh, we heard these planes coming overhead and, you know, you automatically look up, you see the star, okay, it's ours, you know, P-47, and then uh, the next moment uh, you see, I saw, well, we all saw them coming down, they're coming down a dive, you know, a bomb. So. No, we had anti-aircraft gun was with us. Nobody opened fire, and he pulled up, and, he, and they were dropping 500-pound bombs. They got a few of our men there, and ironically is that the guys they got, they were telling them, you know, they tell you in basic training, lay flat on the ground, you make less of a target. And those few guys that I know got it, got it in the back of the head, a piece of shrapnel, you know. But the, what I understood was that uh, during the Battle of the Bulge, the Germans had captured a number of our airplanes and were flying them. And that's, that's the instance I remember. You know, we, then of course, once they dropped the bomb, they were told, shoot them down, and the anti-aircraft were going after them. 
Now, uh, being in the French Armored Division, the 2nd French Armored Division, were you still under Patton, or were you... Well, we initially were with Patton, the 3rd Army, and I don't know when they, when they, uh, when they loaned us out, they said, okay, you guys are part of the 2nd French Armored Division. I imagine we were under the command of Leclerc, who was the French general. Uh, but then when we did leave the, uh, when we left the French division, uh, right out of um, Paris, we left them. We went back to the Third Army. We also was, was, were in the Seventh Army for a while. And we were shifted around quite a bit. I remember one night we drove um, 75 miles to go from one area to another that they needed us. Drove all night long. We, we would just knock, we would just throw, you know, whatever you did, they needed us, they took, they sent us. Did you ever encounter Pat at all? I never did. Did you, what were your feelings about him? Is it? Well, when that, the slapping occurred, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I think the average GI didn't like it, you know. He was a little bit uh, too rough for him. I can understand a young soldier breaking down like that. Mm -hmm. Um, were you aware of the kind of existent, existence of concentration camps? Yes, in fact, I was in one. Yes. I, uh, the one that we went through was Auschwitz, I believe. They went right outside Austria. And uh, we went there. And I, I might, we might have been maybe the first ones to get there, practically the first ones because I saw heaps of bodies, you know, big piles of bodies on the ground. And then we took a walk down the crematorium and doors were open, ashes were in there, you know. They, had, they hadn't left uh, too long. And uh, that's what I remember about it. I saw the whole thing. I seen these people piled up, they just skin and bones, you know. They didn't have time to bury them, I imagine. And uh, that's it. I saw the ovens. What was your reaction when you saw these things? Well, you know, uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, you know, uh, I've seen, uh, during this tour that I did, you'd look down, you'd, you know, you'd be moving around, going up to another position, you'd see, you'd see a lot of GIs laying there with the, their tent over them, they just spread it over them. You know that it was one of ours, you know. And uh, at first when I saw that, it bothered me, but then, then I don't know what happened to me. I just didn't bother me no more. It was not a body. I saw Germans laying there. Uh, I, you know, I, when the Germans pulled out, they usually left some guys behind to hold us back. And I never, never uh, can forget the time I, we were moving up and I seen this German had a machine gun, no head. They just, whatever hit him, took his head right off. So. You know, I, I, the reaction is, uh, for momentarily, you, you know, you're, you're shocked, but then you get over it. But believe me, it's there. It was there. But anybody says that never happened, they're wrong. Did you ever encounter the Russians? No, the only time I encountered the Russians, the Russians was when uh, we were moving up again, and uh, we passed a camp. It was a prisoner of war camp. And... Uh, Funny, there was a, a group of guys in there, and I saw, I saw these, uh, I, I, in fact, I went over to the fence, I was talking to them, there was Italian prisoner of wars in there, and they had Russians too. But the Italian prisoner of war, uh, funny, I, you know, I said, I said, you, you Italian? They, you know, they were excited that I could speak a little Italian. And you know, oh, I got a brother in uh, Jersey, I got, you know, they were telling me their relatives, and they lived in the States, right? And, uh, oh, you come tonight, I'm gonna make some pasta, you know, this kind of stuff. So, um, I don't know, I, I didn't go back because we were moving, but uh, one guy gave me a ring that he made. Of course, I lost it. It's a beautiful ring. He, he made a nice ring, and he gave it to me. And uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. He passed a lot of prisoner war camps on the way up, you know. They were fenced in, and uh, they wanted to talk to you. Did you ever liberate any with Americans? In? Pardon me? Did you li liberate any that had no, Americans? No, no. 
POW? Oh, no. No, I never did that. I never, I never was saw any, any uh, prisoner wars, American. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction uh, when VE v Day was announced? Well, VE Day was, uh, like I said, I was in, uh, right around Austria at the time, Salzburg. And, uh, well, we were, we was, we, hey, the war is over as far as we're concerned, right? But they had other ideas. They were going to send me back to the States and go to Japan. But um, we were very happy. Anyway, getting back to that, that incident when the, when the war was over the, and the, they sent me back to, to the States to train with the 342nd to go to, to, go to the Pacific, they gave me a two-week furlough before we could got together again. So when I went home, I... Um, just then the war ended in Japan. So it was all over for me. So all I had to do was report back to Fort Dix, and they discharged me. Now my old outfit, the 250, they were over there. They had to stay there for a while. They were part of the occupation force. But luckily I was home and they got rid of me. What was your reaction to the nuclear bombs, the atomic bombs being dropped down? Well, um, I think, oh, I remember when I was coming home, uh, when the war in Europe was over, I was coming home, we came, over, came home on a, a Navy ship, was, was heaven compared to what I went on going there. And uh, we heard, they had a radio on the, uh, on the deck, we were out there, and I heard, that was when I heard that the uh, United States bomber, U.S. bomber, rammed into the Empire State Building when I was on the ship coming home. And we said, oh, gee, where's, what are they doing? They're bombing New York, you know? But uh, that was uh, when I heard about that. And uh, as far as the atomic bomb is concerned, uh, it was so fast, and the war had ended so, you know, right after that. Uh, it was a good feeling, happy feeling. I thought they saved a lot of American lives. How do you feel that your experiences in, in the military service uh, changed or affected your life? Well, I, uh, I, I missed a few years, of course. I, you know, I uh, didn't complete my uh, schooling, but I was lucky when I got out. I got a nice job, a good job. And uh, I just tried to forget. I tried, I tried to forget it, you know. I just, uh, although I, I, uh, as, I don't think the day goes by, I don't think about something about the service, you know. I always think about it. I, uh, I was in contact with the 250th Field Artillery, which I spent uh, nine-tenths of my uh, army time with, and uh, they had, we had a reunion maybe 30 years ago, and then I, I didn't hear no more from them. I, I tried a computer. It just seems that uh, I can't reach them anymore. Uh, I, now this this other outfit, the 342nd, which I was only in maybe two months, they're having a reunion in September. And uh, you will attend it. I don't know them too well, but I, I think I'd like to go. I want to bring my wife with me, you know, because it's going to be right near Niagara Falls, and we haven't been there, so uh, we're going to go, if God willing. And uh, you took my next question. Uh, do you, are you involved with any um, American Legion groups or veterans? No, I don't. Or anything like that? You know, I, um, I always intended to, to join the uh, Veterans of Foreign Wars. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, maybe I was so busy, you know, raising a family that I never did. Did you make use of the GI Bill at all? Uh, no, I didn't use the GI Bill at all. When I came out of uh, the service, I got a job driving a rail truck for sixty-five dollars a week, which was good money then, in 1945. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met my wife then. And uh, then I went to uh, Brooklyn Tech uh, uh, in Brooklyn, and uh, uh, I took up oil burner repairs and service for a year. I went to night school. And when I left there, I got a job. And like I say, thank God, everything worked out fine for me. How big of a family do you have? I have uh, two boys, and 
three grandchildren. When did you get married? I didn't ask that. Well, that's my wife. Wait a minute. <laughs> when, when did we get married? 
I don't know how to hold them. Now, where did you obtain these cards? In the, right in the house. Oh, really? Right in the house? Yeah, right in Hitler's house. And my friend, my buddy, who lives in Brooklyn, he got a telephone out of there. Now, can, it, can yeah. we see that one that's in behind there? You see the two flags, and there was... This one? What? No, no. The blue one? Yeah, what's... Oh, okay. All right, I didn't see that. Oh, I got some before. better ones than that. I got to show you some beauties. There's some beautiful cards here. Yeah, one very colorful. Now, I got some pictures of here that I hate to say I took off some German soldiers uh, with their picture, their wives, their mother and fathers, or whatever. There's one of them. There's one of one of their bombers. Okay. There's one of Hitler. Now you picked this up. I got that right in the house. Wow. A little beat up. Uh -huh. Okay. See all the guys of any interest. There's a pretty one. Must be flag, unit flags. Yeah. No. Okay. Here's one of the German officer. Okay. I can't read German, but they got their names on them. There's another German officer. This is a pretty one. Okay. Ah, here's, here's a picture of uh, one of the German soldiers, I guess is his wife. He had, a, he had on him, he was deceased. Okay. And here's the writing in the back. I can't read it. Here's some, uh, these are pretty good pictures. These are the ones of their, their Air Force in training. He's all taken out of, the, out of his house. All right. There's a tank corps. Okay. That one, I don't you want to see. You want a few more? Sure. Here's another picture of one of their bombers. I see the back here, Deutschland does land the new flugel. I don't know what that means. It's, uh, of course, it's right above the picture. Interesting. It, it's all, the back of these pictures all are in German. Can you read that? Can you make it up? Three years of German. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, here's here's the back of that picture of that guy's wife. Maybe you can read that. Okay. Do you have anything else? That's all. Okay. Mike, anything? No. Well, thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I mean, my memory don't go back. You know, that far, but what I do recall is what I told you. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.